the reason I'm for the motion is that um, I think we, we really have no choice except to seriously consider uh, the use of geoengineering to, to cover the period that's upon us quite soon, or is already upon us, whereby the rate of global warming due to carbon dioxide and methane being put into the atmosphere by man is becoming so rapid that it threatens to, to run away with itself or to run away with us. So, in other words, as some famous person said, what's the choice? Not a famous, not a famous phrase, but anyway. And the reason is that um, the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere, which has now exceeded 400 parts uh, a million, is sufficient if you don't add any more to actually raise global temperatures in the end by about four degrees. And we've got uh, the, the politicians, uh, as an excuse for doing nothing really, came up with this idea that two degrees of warming is what we can tolerate before things get rather bad. And they based that two degrees on some of the uh, earlier work by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it implied that we could still produce uh, and emit quite a lot of CO2 before we've emitted enough to give us two degrees of warming. But more recent work on, on the climate sensitivity of the planet to CO2 suggest, and because CO2 itself is so long lived in the atmosphere, it's hundreds of years it has an influence. Um, it's, this suggests that the, the warming will actually uh, reach to, has already reached two degrees. I mean, if we use a, a higher value for climate sensitivity, um, then we conclude that in fact this two degree limit was reached in the 1960s. So that the, warm, the amount of CO2 we put into the atmosphere by then, if we stopped emitting and just let the, uh, the climate gradually warm, it would warm by two degrees. So we haven't got any carbon left to spend. We haven't got a budget anymore. We passed that budget uh, some decades ago. So everything we emit now is taking us beyond that. And as we know, uh, carbon dioxide is very long lived in the atmosphere. It's a ratchet effect. We put it into the atmosphere quite happily, in immediately, instantly by burning fossil fuels. But it takes several hundred years for a molecule of carbon dioxide to work its way out of the Earth, atmosphere, ocean, uh, biological system, and into somewhere where it's not doing any more damage, like the bottom of the ocean. So we can't get back to, to a climate that's, that's not rapidly warming unless we don't just have to reduce our carbon emissions, we actually have to stop them, and we don't even just have to stop them, we have to start taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So while we get around to doing that, and we're getting around to it very, very slowly, because at the moment there's no sign even of a reduction of the rate of increase of carbon dioxide emissions. It's still going up exponentially. There's no sign that it's decreasing, whatever uh, politicians say. And there isn't, it can be very difficult to reduce it anyway, because the way that fossil fuel is built into the structure of our society, the structure of our cities, I mean, what do you do with Los Angeles if you can't burn fossil fuels to get about? Um, what do you do with the shopping centres around Cambridge? So we can't easily reduce our carbon emissions, and we're not even trying at the moment. And if, even if we did, it wouldn't be enough. We've already got too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So ultimately, we have to find ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that's this is not strictly geoengineering, it's, it's another set of, of measures that will be needed in the long run. Um, techniques like uh, uh, putting sodium hydroxide trees, which are where you, you expose sodium hydroxide to the atmosphere and take carbon dioxide out. Um, olivine rocks, which react with carbon dioxide, you can spread them around everywhere. Very, very expensive methods, and really we don't have a method that's, that isn't possibly expensive yet. So lots of research is needed on taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's a long way ahead, but we have to do it. So in the meantime, there's a gap. There's a period where we can't tolerate the rate of warming that, that carbon dioxide is given us, but we have to 
to, to try to reduce that rate of warming because of the way it's leading to disappearance of Arctic sea ice, disappearance of the Greenland ice sheet, all those knock-on feedback effects which are multiplying the, the impact of global warming. So if we can apply a sticking plaster during that period when we gradually get around to finding ways to reduce emissions and take carbon out of the atmosphere, we have to do it. And or we, we have to really try to do it. And that's where geoengineering techniques, the, the ones that, that Hugh Hunt has described, can come in and can come in quite cheaply in relation to, say, military budgets. Um, and they will work, although the, the dangers, of course, which I think colleagues here are going to talk about, are that what it will do to the atmosphere in, in reducing the rate of warming, or, or actually knocking back warming into a cooling, um, could have dangers and impacts which we don't understand. So the, the case against, which I, I shouldn't make what it's for, is we've already messed up the earth by technology, so if we apply more technology, we're going to mess it up worse. So that's the sort of um, pessimistic view of mankind with technology, which is possibly justified. But we have to try, I think, and we have to try methods that are as benign as possible. For instance, marine cloud brightening, which uses only water, um, as opposed to methods that use sulfur dioxide or possibly other toxic materials released into the stratosphere. But at least we have to try something. And, um, or, or more benign methods like some kind of targeted afforestation. But we can't do nothing, and uh, this is why I, I believe that we have to really act now focus on um, methods that we can uh, apply to actually achieve some kind of, of delay in the, in the warming. It won't save us from things like ocean acidification, effects which are purely due to CO2, like um, the absorption of CO2 by the ocean and what that does to the structure of the ocean, um, and possibly absorption of heat by the ocean, ocean acidification, which is going on the pace and is causing um, loss of corals and is causing also uh, possibly loss of marine life from killing off um, shellfish. But um, it won't do anything about those things, but it will slow down and it's, it certainly would slow down or stop if you apply enough of it, uh, global warming for as long as you keep applying it. And, and what we have to do is to investigate what would be the likely uh, impacts, the likely side effects, and then I believe we should be going ahead and trying to start trials on methods that we could use. Uh, because the, the, the ultimate being an insurance policy against an unexpected horror, and the unexpected horror that I expect as a possibility <laughs> is a sudden burst of methane from the Arctic seabed, which is being studied at the moment. It's already something like it is already happening, but it could happen in, in a much to a much greater extent. Uh, and it's been foreseen that maybe 50 gigatons of methane could be released in 10 years, which will give in itself a 0.6 degree warming of the global climate within a few years. That would be a disastrous change, uh, and is due to the fact that the seabed with the sea ice retreating from the Arctic, uh, is warming up and releasing this methane. If that happens, and uh, we've, we've sort of forecast that it will and calculated the cost, which will be stratospheric, then we, we need to have something in our back pocket that we can try to apply to reduce the, the warming that's doing this. So we either have to do that uh, in the way of, of uh, new techniques or a special technique just for methane, like a sort of fracking where you pour in under the methane and So we need that uh, as an insurance policy against the kind of catastrophic effect that might happen. So I think we need, therefore, to consider pure engineering techniques. Thank you. I wanted to ask a person who makes these kind of prognostications many times, and that is, 
Here we have a room full of people whose lives are ahead of them. What are they supposed to do and how are they supposed to respond to, to this? Because it feels very top-down. Um, yes, but it's not, it's not really top-down. Um, it's, it's because they're, they're the ones who are going to have to live through this. <laughs> and, uh, the, the, I think the, initially it is because the, the um, methods that you are going to be used or need to be used if you're going to do um, geoengineering are very expensive. I said they're cheap. That means they're cheap in relation to military budgets. They're cheap in relation to um, what it would cost to take carbon out of the atmosphere, which at the moment is, is about $300 a tonne, which is a completely outrageous figure. We can't afford to do it. Um, so lots of very expensive research will be needed on removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And but even doing the, the geoengineering, because it's a global effect, it will need to be done on an international basis by with some international body regulating it. So inevitably you're dealing with governments. So the, the impact of, of, of normal human beings must be to influence our governments to do the things that are needed instead of just doing nothing, which is what they're doing at the moment, um, and to do what's needed. To, to be able to, to, to handle this problem and save us from some really terrible consequences if we have run away global warming. Matt, question for you. My understanding of the current literature is that if we stopped uh, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere tomorrow, we would stay under two degrees. I'm not, I'm not an expert at this, but that, that's where most of my climate modeling friends tell me we are. It's obvious we're not going to do that, so that's a bit of a corollary. But could you address the question of preempting some sort of mode of despair, a, a, a catastrophe that we might avoid? So I, I think it's absolutely clear that we're going to hit a climate catastrophe soon, and this debate becomes rather fraught. But actually, I think the conventional wisdom is we still have time to do this well, well, that's 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 yes, I mean, that's the view I would challenge that we still have time. Um, I think we have to do something straight away. And one that, that could hit it immediately, which is the, which is the one I mentioned, uh, and it's, it's being seen to be happening now by the annual expeditions to the Arctic, is the emission of methane from the seabed, which promises. I mean, there's there's massive amounts of methane there. 1,500 gigatons, of which we're assuming about 50 will come out. But there's equally large amounts of methane uh, in or being generated by melting permafrost on land. Uh, so, and that will happen. The, the offshore might not. It might, it might still hang on in there. But on land, the, the, the permafrost is melting, and the total amount of methane that is to be released is very, very large. So that's something that will happen and that we have to, to <coughs> try to find a way to deal with. We, we, can, we can deal with the offshore methane if we spend a lot of money on drilling these fracking type wells underneath the, the, uh, the, the sediments, which would please the oil industry because they do that for us uh, and of course remove the methane in the process and sell it. But it, they would be serving bad kind for once. Um, but, but permafrost on land, uh, you can't do anything about it stopping that emission. And that's where you need to have something that will hold back the, the warming that's caused it. We have time for a question from the floor. Yes. So the question is that um, we're a bit puzzled that we're already two degrees warmer. Uh, are we already two degrees? We're just under one degree warmer than pre-industrial levels at the moment. But um, the, the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere now will mean that if we, if we stop any more emissions and just sit there, um, the, the climate will keep warming because it, it takes decades for the carbon to work its way through the system and produce a fully realised warming from the amount, that, from the transient warming that you get um, in 
Sorry, I'm saying it's it's no more carbon dioxide is emitted except for the silver. Yes, if we had, if we, if we suddenly went back to Stone Age and didn't emit any more carbon dioxide, then in about 100 years' time, we'd have two degrees of warming. The, the temperature would keep going up. So uh, that's why it's it's false for the politicians to say we're keeping the warming below two. We're keeping it. We can keep it below two degrees of realised warming, but uh, ultimately we'll go past that as well. Another question here. The business of the uh, Arctic warming. Um, it seems to be warming very much faster than the uh, IPCC have reckoned and the, the uh, uh, exponential curve indicates that the sea ice should, might disappear in, uh, in a couple of years uh, at the end of summer. Uh, so how, how are we going to stop that? Is, uh, well, is there any natural mechanism that's going to stop this happening? Well, I don't think there is. Uh, that I can think of. I mean, I've, I've forecast that it would, summer sea ice will disappear in a year or two's time and so uh, I think that it will and it, uh, this, this summer it will stay about the same as last year but next year uh, with an El Nino it will go back, go down and probably disappear in a year or two but it will be gone, the summer sea ice will be gone soon and then the ice free season will grow to two, three, four months and I don't see a way, the only way again is uh, if we if we apply geoengineering kind of relentlessly, and if our initial research shows that you can target it regionally, that you can target the the Arctic by one of the techniques like marine cloud brightening, then that would be great because that would be a way of bringing back the sea ice, and bringing back the sea ice will reduce the methane emissions. Uh, but I suspect all our geoengineering techniques will tend to have global effects rather than regional. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter.